What's going on guys? So over the last year, I've increased my synth collection by a few, adding the Access Virus TI and the Walder of Quantum, two synths I thought I would never buy, but after borrowing them for a bit, I honestly totally caved. So in this video, I want to talk about the top five synths that I wish I own, but I would never, ever, never, never, ever, never buy. And no, this isn't a video about these are bad synthesizers. Just as someone who personally can't imagine adding more and more synths over time, these are just the top five that I would love to have, but probably could never justify spending money on. So number five, a Roland Jupiter 8. And I don't know if this is the most iconic polyphonic synthesizer of all time, but it's definitely a beast in the world of synthesizer enthusiasts. So it came out in 1981 and was Roland's first flagship professional analog synthesizer. So it had eight voices, two oscillators per voice, and it was actually simple to find your way around the interface. The Jupiter 8 had been used on countless records and you can layer and split. It's got two pole and four pole low pass filters and a high pass filter. Uh, I personally owned a Juno 106 and there's just something about that sound. And, and people say that the Jupiter 8 is even better than the Juno 106. So just looking at the price of a Jupiter 8 in 2022 makes my eyes water. So why would I personally never buy one? Well, years ago, I promised myself that I would never buy another synthesizer without factory included MIDI. And that's the case here. So sure, you can have it retrofitted, but that just adds to its current astronomical price. And at an average cost of 15 to $20,000, let's be real, I just should avoid ever looking at a Roland Jupiter 8 in a serious way. Number four, the Waldorf Wave. And I quickly want to read a quote about the Waldorf Wave from the company themselves. <clears throat> so I quote, the wave represents one of the peaks in synthesizer technology. Its dimension and grace alone brings musicians to their knees in collective devotion. Without a doubt, the wave is the most impressive, the most expressive, and at the same time, the user-friendliest sound synthesis tool ever built. Already, the basic model has a character so powerful and individual that even fastidious professionals may break into a frenzy of affection. <laughs> Talk about a pat on the back. Well, yes, the Waldorf wave may have been the summit of Waldorf synthesis in the 90s. Its lineage, its impact would inspire later instruments and a personal favorite of mine because of its color, the XDK. So as you can see, the Waldorf wave is very hands-on with well laid out sections and a very knobby interface. It's got analog filters and up to 48 voices, 48 voices of polyphony. So why not for me? Well, the Waldorf wave is one of the most elusive synthesizers ever. I've only ever seen less than a half dozen for sale and adding on to it, who the heck is gonna fix such an advanced synthesizer going forward? Now, Waldorf as a company has changed hands many times and truthfully, I see a lot of the wave in the quantum. Kind of look at the layout here, right? So I guess that will have to do for me. Number three, the Moog Model D. And this is the most iconic monosynth of all time, right? I, I'd have to say yes. Everyone knows what the Model D brings to the table. Three oscillators of 70s and 80s Moog goodness. The beyond iconic Moog ladder filter design. It's got the pose value that people love and it's got wood on wood on wood. And I actually never played an original mini Moog, but I have played the Voyagers and reissues. And yeah, I can't imagine how an OG mini Moog would sound after 50 years, but I could just never justify it. One, because the MIDI thing. And two, honestly, I just don't know where it would fit in my setup. It's so priceless and historic that I couldn't even see myself actually using it. It's just something that I want to sit down and look at and marvel. The saving grace, I think, of a vintage Model D is that you could probably get Moog to fix it due to its design and their status and legacy in, as a company. Now hold up, I want to take a quick break and give a shout out to the sponsor of this video, 
Lander. Now, Lander is an online platform that you can master your music easily. It's super quick, and I've used it to master my own music. You just have to go up here and click Master. You can change the type of parameters you want on your mix, and it's just super simple and straightforward. You can distribute your music to online streaming platforms, you know, like Spotify, Apple Music. It's so easy and quick. I want your music to go from this to this. And it is so simple. So use my code on screen or in the description below and save 30% off on Lander's all access pass. Now also you can sign up for Lander and get a free trial. Signing up for Lander is super quick and easy. And I think that anybody who just wants to quickly master their music with quality can do it with Lander. So remember, check the description, sign up for Lander. You can get a free trial and it's really that easy. So back to the video. Now, number two, the Sequential Circuits Profit VS. And this is tough since I always wanted a Profit VS. And this is probably most likely the synth I'm still on the edge about owning one day in the future, uh, but I probably won't. So the Profit VS came out in 1986. And realistically, I feel like Dave Smith was on a whole nother level with his thinking here. So the Profit VS is a eight voice vector synthesizer with four oscillators per voice and user addable waveforms. So you could perform dynamic waveform changes with the joystick and the internal chorus effect and panning of the voices to create enormous sounds. Now, this was a very underrated synthesizer and still is in my opinion, but it's the most widely available synthesizer on this list with an achievable price tag. So now, why wouldn't I own one? Well, probably because I'd buy a Poly Evolver first, but everything about the Profit VS was ahead of its time. And of course, number one, the Yamaha CS80. Now, I'm just going to place one picture on the screen, which will explain exactly why I will never buy a Yamaha CS80. Oh my God! Now, the Yamaha CS80, to my ears, is the most organic sounding synthesizer I've ever heard. Its sonic signature is just, it surpasses everything. It's been used on so many records and loved by so many people. So it was released in 1977 and it sported two oscillators per voice for a total of 16 oscillators, a two pole high pass and low pass filter, polyphonic aftertouch, a ring modulator. You also had chorus and tremolo on board. I mean, this, this is an out of this world instrument. So real quick for me, why I wouldn't buy it? Well. I guess one, I don't have $100,000. Two, it doesn't have MIDI. And three, it comes in at a back breaking 200 pounds of weight for this thing. And I live on a third floor. So it's the holy grail of sense without a doubt. And I can say confidently that there will never be another Yamaha CS80. Anyways, in the comment section, let me know what your top five since that you would want but would never buy are. Um, yeah, and someday I might get the Profit VS. I don't know if I'm super old. So remember to like, subscribe, follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks again for watching guys and I'll see you in the next one. Just as someone who personally can't imagine as a legacy, as a legacy, long history and legacy, 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 Jeez. and legacy in, in I, I was so close. Is the holy grail, is the holy grail,